All right. Great. Hi, everyone. My name is Josh Siegel. Uh, I'm the winner of the 2015 Lemelson MIT uh, National Collegiate Student Prize Competition in the Drive It category. I'm a grad student here at MIT. Uh, and before I go any further, I really do want to thank the Lemelson Foundation, the Lemelson MIT program for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, it, it's been fantastic being involved, and I can already tell that this is a, a great program for everyone to be a part of. So really awesome. And also thanking uh, family and friends and faculty advisors. So with that said, uh, today I'm going to be talking about engineering connectivity, hot rodding in the digital era. And uh, I, I like to tell stories in my presentation. So this is going to be anecdotal. This is going to be my own life story. And some of the lessons I learned about inventing, some of the hard fought lessons that uh, maybe I struggled through and I can save you from going through the same thing with. So I'll work you through my own life and then get up to my invention and hopefully get you excited about the possibilities for that. So I want to start with the assertion that everyone is born an engineer. And I don't think one becomes an engineer. I think someone is an engineer until they're no longer one. And you can look at babies escaping from their cribs, right? They see an opportunity. They see a challenge. They try different things. And then eventually, they find a solution that works. And, and this is engineering, or, or uh, a kid playing with the ball, dropping it, and learning about gravity. So I think it's not becoming, engin uh, becoming an engineer, becoming an inventor that's the problem. It's maintaining this motivation to be an engineer that's really a challenge and, and something that a lot of people struggle with. And I believe that the answer to this problem is momentum. You just need to charge through it. So you need to live your life engineering and solving problems. And in my own case, uh, I live by those words. So I, I constantly look for problems to solve. I take things apart. Uh, sometimes I put them back together. More often than not, they don't work. Uh, I listen to problems that are out there, and I try and solve them. And I'm constantly out there just trying to learn. So this talk today, there are a lot of bullet points that I'm going to go through. But bear with me. We'll get through it. I promise you it's not that bad. <laughs> so the first thing is to use passion as a starting point for innovation, then learning experientially, understanding that failure is a beginning, not an end, making use of all available resources no matter where you are, who you are, and who you know, understanding that challenges are opportunities, and that when you solve or address an opportunity creatively, then there's potential for uh, big impact. Writing your own headlines, which I'll talk about a little more, and then pushing until you can push no further. So keep charging ahead with this idea. So I told you I like stories, so I'm going to start with a story now. Uh, those of you who have talked to me already probably know that I'm a bit of a car guy. I grew up in Detroit. This is my first car, a 1955 Chevy. Her name is Lucy. She wasn't always that shiny. And, and this is the story of my passion. I loved cars. I really wanted to get involved with cars and understand anything and everything I could about them. Because they're, they're beautiful. They encompass so much of STEM. There's artistry and craftsmanship. And I think it's really amazing when you can take passion and channel it towards something. Because you can do something really productive with that and something that, that changes other people's lives as well as your own. So I mentioned learning experientially. In, in my own case, uh, I would take everything off that car, polish it, and put it back together. And this is really what I credit with giving me a lot of my mechanical and electrical knowledge. Getting in there, getting my hands dirty. This is the mens et manus that Professor Sarma was talking about. So understanding really how things work together. And that really helped me to build a library of mechanical and electrical assemblies that I could draw on later in life. So I was obviously really into cars, and I wanted to take the next step. And, uh, I started uh, with my high school's robotics team at this point. I joined a FIRST team. And I learned a number of things from FIRST. FIRST is awesome. But the one thing that I want to share with you is that failure is not an end point. Failure is a beginning. It teaches you what not to do. And uh, <laughs> fail fast, learn, and move on. And I had a lot of failures. So this is an autonomous vehicle I tried to build. The lighting's not great, but there's a garbage can. Swerve to avoid it and kind of just cut out there. And this is the story of my, my learning to build autonomous vehicles, or not really. So you know, that didn't go out so well. But, but I ended up here at MIT, and, and now I'm up here. So uh, don't let these things get you down. So the next thing is to make use of all available resources. And that could be student programs. That could be tools that you have accessible. That could just be knowing people who are interested in the same thing that you are. In my case, I left Detroit. I came to MIT as an undergraduate. And there weren't enough cars here. There's something called the Sloan Auto Lab, but they work on engines. And I, I wanted to work on cars. So I got involved with the electric vehicle team. And around the same time, uh, I launched my first company building this thing on the right-hand side, which is called an inertial navigation unit. Uh, 
and, and we told people that it was to help soldiers navigate if they were in caves or urban canyons. Really, I just wanted to build a really awesome self-driving go-kart that could go really fast. <laughs> so in, in the spirit of taking advantage of these opportunities, I got involved with what's called the Europe program at MIT, the Undergraduate Research Opportunity. And that's where I met Professor Sanjay Sarma, who spoke, spoke earlier. He's now my PhD advisor. But we started working on a project to estimate the distance that vehicles had traveled. And that's because right now when you buy a gallon of gasoline, you pay a certain amount of money on that. But hybrid and electric vehicles don't use gas or don't use as much. So you needed to find another way of accounting for that impact. And what I really learned was that this was a big challenge. right? So there's something called onboard diagnostics in a car. And it's great in theory, but it really only gives you access to about 23 parameters. And they're not so helpful if you're trying to understand what a car is really doing. So I had this challenge. And I wanted to solve it creatively. And that's where my invention comes in. I know you were wondering when I was going to get to it. So uh, my invention uh, is basically a little device and a software platform that connects your car to the internet. And I knew that if I solved this problem creatively, that there was a big opportunity. So I launched a company around it. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about that after. But this platform really starts with the device. So this is called the Carduino. And it's called the Carduino because it's an open source piece of hardware that plugs into your car and basically lets your car live tweet you. It pulls all the data out of your car, not just what the manufacturer would typically give you. And uh, as I mentioned, it's open source. And if your car has a lot of data in it, but it's not really a platform that anyone's worked with before, it helps you reverse engineer your own vehicle. So what does this platform look like? Uh, we build what's called an avatar. An avatar is a digital duplicate of your physical vehicle in the cloud which is kind of a big mouthful. Uh, but you plug the device into your car. It talks to all these devices on the network within your vehicle. And then through the magic of open source and wiki type databases and reverse engineering, we let you do what's called translation in the cloud. And that means whether you drive a Ford or a GM or a Honda or a Toyota, any type of car, you write one application, it works on all of them. So I'm really making tools that help people access the information that's already in their vehicle. So what can you do with this? Well, I can tell you about driving habits. How does a person typically use their vehicle? I can tell you about a vehicle state of health. Is something failing? Is something behaving better than expected? I can help you improve your fuel efficiency, or maybe even understand where you idle to reduce your CO2 footprint. I can also uh, identify when to change your oil to within about 10 miles. I can help you identify imbalance issues long before they're perceptible to drivers. And these are just some of the things that you can do with this platform. So I have a quick little video to show you. Uh, this is an older version of the device, but you plug it into the standard diagnostic port, but it taps into all of this data within your car, the manufacturer data too. Uh, there's an application that tells you what data it's going to get from you. You give it permission, password protected. So this is sort of a remote control application. We have a range of things that I'll describe as sensing, inference, and action. Sensing is pulling data from sensors. Inference is uh, managing that data. And action is responding. So we build this platform and do everything from configure your seats to where you want them to show you what's going on in your car in real time. Uh, so this is an application that goes from what I would call uh, reactive to proactive. Right? Some cars you buy now will roll up the windows when it starts to rain. This will look at the rain forecast and then roll up your windows before it starts to rain. And I want to reiterate that this platform is open. Uh, I don't have all the best ideas for this. I'm sure some of you have fantastic ideas that I would love to see on the platform. So please do talk to me after if that's the case. Uh, but I want to help people access their vehicle in a way that they haven't been able to in many years. I want everyone to be able to have the thrill of working on their, their own car and sort of hot rodding it. So one piece of advice that Professor Sarma gave me that's guided me through the last couple of years is to write your own headlines. He said, think about what you want your New York, uh, New York Times headline to be and work towards that. And I think that that's a really important tool, because it helps you think about what you want to do, where you want to go with your life. And it's a good, uh, basically, mile, mile marker to understand how far you've come and how far you have to go. And in my case, this isn't the New York Times, but I think the Wired article is pretty good affirmation. And uh, also winning the 2014 Mass IT Government Innovation Prize. But that is not a headline I would have approved or chosen, or a photo I would have uh, approved. <laughs> So the last piece of advice I'll give you is to push until you can push no further. And I, I believe in engineering that problems aren't solved, they evolve. So you may have addressed the problem that you started with. But if you're really passionate about this and your, your engineering 
is really your hobby rather than your job, you'll always want to do something more with it. So in my case, I want to predict when cars break down uh, in new ways that I can't already do. I want to help people get in their car and have their user experience be seamless so they don't need to push any buttons. And then understand the Internet of Things architecture. So I know I went through a lot of points, but use passion to drive your innovation and never stop inventing. Thank you. With that, I'll take questions. Um, right here. Uh, when do you expect the self-driving car to be a reality for America? <laughs> the self-driving car is not a technology problem so much as a policy problem. And, and it's tangentially related to this, but there are a lot of implications over data security, privacy, data ownership uh, that need to be addressed first. So I, I think that there will be self-driving cars in labs long before they're on the road but highly autonomous driving, which is a car that will hold itself in a lane on the highway, use adaptive cruise control, and follow the speed limit, I, I think that that's only a, a few years out now. Uh, there are cars on the road that already do it. They don't do it perfectly, but they're, they're a pretty good start. Uh, the app that you had, was that, is it consumer friendly? Like, is it easy to use? Yeah, so uh, this is really a platform, and the apps are just a way of demonstrating what you can do with it. Uh, I don't know how many of you have done software development, but this is what's called a RESTful API. So it's pretty straightforward for people who know how to develop applications. But the vision isn't that people will have to develop an app for their own car. It's really more of an app store type model. So at first, I intend to sell to hacker types who want to modify their cars and write their own apps and understand that this is a product that they're going to help develop and help improve. And once that's done, once the platform is built out and people have reverse engineered their own cars for support, uh, then it'll be consumer friendly. The device itself is plug and play. But right now, uh, unless you, you want to run the exact apps that I'm doing, uh, they do take a little bit of development work, but nothing too crazy. Uh, quick question. Josh, nice work, by the way. Thank you. Um, Let's say that you have an app developed by someone that would, say, automatically raise the windows if it's going to rain. Mm -hmm. And let's say some oh, early innovator like myself is um, adjusting something in the car, <laughs> reaching mm -hmm. through the window, mm -hmm. just before that happens. <laughs> How uh, much faith this, do you have in the automotive manufacturers? <laughs> you have that kind of stuff going, and, and you're distributing some of your um, development to mm -hmm. an unknown population. Right. There's a bit about... Uh, uh, safety and, and how do you do this kind of testing? Is this sure. kind of an interesting one? Have you sure. thought about that? Oh, absolutely. Uh, safety, security, and data ownership and privacy are huge issues, and I'm happy to talk more offline. Suffice it to say, I've got long reports that you guys can read about it. Um, the short version is if we're rolling up the windows, uh, auto manufacturers have current sensing built in so they can tell that the motors have stalled. And so long as the auto manufacturer's done their job, then I'm not, I'm not causing anything. Uh, unduly stressful. <laughs> yeah. It does back up. Most cars actually back up automatically. Yeah. Um, are there any cars that are too old for this? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Uh, every car sold in the US and Europe after 1996 has something called OBD2, that onboard diagnostics protocol I was talking about. That's the thing that I would call necessary but not sufficient. Right? Every car has to have it. It's helpful, but it doesn't do exactly what you want it to do. Um, my system works with what's called CAN bus, or controller area network, and that's found in most cars after 2004 and all cars after 2008. So it's mostly modern vehicles, uh, but if you look at the average life of a car on the road today, I can cover more than half of them. I'll, a I'll ask the next one. What's your next restoration project? Uh, so I'm looking to buy a 68 Mustang convertible. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, I, I think I'm, I'm over my time. <laughs> Thank you.